Welcome, movie fans, to another episode of Hollow Victories, where we honor the plot thieves. I am your host, Matt Presents, joined as always by my very terrestrial co host. Hello, I'm Giorgio Sokolos. Let's talk about aliens. Indeed. So, um, this month we got a an E.T. ripoff matchup. And we're, uh, before we even get into it, I have a problem with one of these movies because I don't know what to call it. Uh, this movie is probably best known for its appearance on the television program Mystery Science Theater 3000, where it went under the title of Pod People. But I have not found the title Pod People anywhere else. Everywhere else credits this movie as extraterrestrial visitors. I think Pod People was probably the TV version of this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but po- Pod People is probably the name it is most familiar under. But if you go looking for it, you will have to find it under the title Extraterrestrial Visitors. And that's uh, that's one of our two movies today. Extraterrestrial Visitors versus the eponymous Mac and Me. Michael, what say you before we get into it? Any Anything you would like to add before we get into this? Oh, no. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking about these two. All right. Then let us begin with... Extraterrestrial visitors, I suppose, is the title we'll call it. We'll call yeah, I mean, it that's extraterrestrial what it, uh, visitors. You, you said it yourself. That is what it was like on Letterboxd on IMDb, like anywhere I looked for it. Yes. So I guess that's what it's known by. But uh, I will probably still put Pod People in the title. Extraterrestrial visitors is a film from 1983. It came out just one year uh, after uh, Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Now this film was already like, sort of in development when uh, E.T. came out. And uh, back then it was, like, a a conventional horror movie, and they sort of shifted in a more E.T. direction because of the success of E.T. Even the title, Extraterrestrial Visitors, makes it very clear they want in on the E.T. bandwagon. In the film, uh, a species lands on the Earth, uh, and it begins dispatching the people in the woods around where it landed. However, uh, a child of this alien has also escaped and met up with a child human boy who begins calling him Trumpy, and uh, he and Trumpy have a whimsical childhood adventure together uh, while Trumpy's parent is uh, killing everyone. Michael, what'd you think? You know... The movie, uh, I could use any movie as an example, Go for Quiet Place, a more modern film. You know how that movie, you know, it's a bunch of horrifying monsters, you make any noise, they come after you. Well, imagine if that movie took one of those monsters and just decided, okay, every once in a while it's going to be a kid's movie about this child bonding with this monster. (laughs) But it's still going to end with a majority of the characters dying, including (laughs) the alien's parents and then the alien, and then the monster is gonna like fuck off and be abandoned. That that is what this movie is. <laughs> it was, it like changed its mind on what it wanted to be way too late into the process because when it cuts to the ET stuff, it is completely disconnected from the rest of the movie. It has oh, nothing yeah. to do with it. Oh yeah, like tone wise. These are two things that do not go together at all. And that does make it more memorable. It makes it a little less boring because, my God, both of these movies on their own are pretty damn boring, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I do think there is, like, a very stark contrast between these two where, like, Mac and Me flies so close to E.T. that it's like, <laughs> how did you not, like, get in even, like, a little trouble for this? Right. Uh, where Where this movie... <laughs> This movie, it's like, you decided way too late you wanted to be E.T., and you are not E.T. for most of the movie. Yeah. Uh, Honest to God, the only scene that gave me, like, a strong E.T. vibe is any scene where he has him hide in the closet, but that's, like, a small thing from E.T., right? And then the scene where they did, like, a little bit of stop motion with the alien moving stuff around in his room. That was like, okay, this feels like it's, like, right out of E.T. Not as well made as E.T., yeah. but even then it was probably the best made scene of that movie. Like, yeah, they did some stop motion. It was cute. <laughs> yeah. Here's my thing, and I, I think you would said you disagreed with this, but I, I think 
when the movie is being an E.T. ripoff, it's far more interesting than when it's being a horror movie. If it had just stuck to horror movie, it'd probably be more coherent, mm -hmm. but it would also probably be much more boring. <laughs> I think both are really boring, but I prefer the stuff that's a horror movie just because I think that the voiceover dub for the kid is, like, really ear grading. Like, I did not <laughs> enjoy listening to that kid speak, and I, it, to me it sounds Obvious like... an adult woman. Yeah, to me it sounds like it may have been one of the woman voicing, like, one of the adult characters. I, I also said this is... I also think it's weird, because you said that they're dubbing a German movie, right? But, like... Yes, this is a, a German movie. <sighs> it did look like they were speaking English sometimes, reading their lips. Uh, maybe that's... Th that That's, like, speculation on my end. I could be completely wrong, but sometimes it's, like, it looks like their lips were matching what the voiceover was saying, it just was a little off. Like, it wasn't in sync properly, but that was more of, like, an editing mistake. Um, and other times it seemed way off, so I have no idea. I just thought that was very bizarre. But, again, that's yeah. that's speculative. I I could be I'm wrong sorry, about uh, this that. Is, this is Spanish from Spain. Hmm. Not, uh, not German. Okay. But worth noting, yes, that this is uh, uh, one, of, one of our first foreign films, right? We did the Turkey matchup earlier this year, and that was really, like, the first foreign language films we looked at. So we, we slipped another one in there. We're only picking the highest quality movies when focused on different countries. <laughs> Just to show that we're not biased. Yeah, Three Dev Adam was pretty fun. I, I had fun watching both of those, uh, but... This one I did not have fun with. This one I was really <laughs> bored. Um, there was a couple of moments that I got a laugh out of. I got a laugh out of the... Honest to God, yeah. I did get a laugh out of the kid's voice for a second. But then I had to keep listening to it. Because it's just... I don't... Oh, man. I don't like it when adults who can't voice act try to do a child's voice. I really hate that. Like, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. If, you, if it's an adult who has just a goofy enough sounding voice, like... Kristen Shaw or whoever voices Dipper. I, I'm naming Maple, Mabel and Dipper, but like, yeah, those two, that's a fine way to do a voice for a kid. Um, or if it's just someone who can like impersonate a child's voice really well. Or if you even do something like what fucking South Park does, just pitch the voices a little bit. Um, I, I'm, I'm completely for that, but I, there is so many fucking animes I've seen where it's just an adult woman talking like this, and I hate that. It, it it's just oh, so Michael, you're great in you me. don't like you don't like these voices no you didn't like the dubbing in this movie not at all it reminds me a little of um one of the camera movies my favorite one he fights like the knife head thing and uh there's like these aliens in it that are clearly played by japanese women but they have this like southern drawl to their voice and it's like <laughs> whoa hold on that's that's not right. <laughs> uh, um, I guess, uh, I mean, shit, where do we go with this one? We could, I, I, we always can talk about casting, but it's going to be like, this one's going to be a little weird because are these people even going to show up if we try to look them up? <laughs> like, this was not a very popular uh, movie anywhere, right? Mac and me, I, I, you can look those actors up, but. Yeah, there are, there are actors in uh, Mac and me. I mean, there are people to talk about in this cast. It's For not sure. like complete nobodies. I I think I maybe want to start with the director, uh, Juan Pierre Simone, just because he's worked on like some pretty infamous, like uh, <laughs> horror movies, some like well known like cult horror movies. He made Pieces and Slugs, which are both like great gore classics are they good movies or are they good like uh pieces is pretty decent slugs is like a little silly but i do enjoy it damn boy. i enjoy it a lot i enjoy it a lot more than uh extraterrestrial visitors i gotta say yeah he was born in 1935 this was i mean he he died in 2011 he's not still around but damn he saw the early films before going off to make extraterrestrial visitors. Yeah, anything else to say about him? He made Supersonic Man, whatever that is. I should cover that on Spiny Norman. One. I I have heard of that one. It's in my watch list, but I've not seen it. That should be I also have a copy. 
I have a copy of Cthulhu Mansion, which is one of his. Uh, Cthulhu Mansion. Uh, Vinegar Syndrome put it out. But I have not watched it, actually. It's too late to do it. I have seen Pieces and Slugs. He says Pieces and Slugs. What if that was, like, the follow-up movie? That was, like, his glass. I don't know. I, I think that, like, my lack of... I, I think I'm really showcasing how little I have to say about this movie. It's boring, but I definitely could talk about some of the characters. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's talk about the characters. I think the best performance in the movie probably comes from the old guy, just because he does successfully sound like an old disgruntled man, where everyone else, I'm not really sure what they're going for. Um, just boring teenagers, I guess. I, although, actually, the girl who's, like... The really insecure girl, she's probably, like, second place. She was all right, too. Although, again, it's weird yeah. because it's dubs, but, like, um, but she was fine, you know. Though I'd say those yeah. two are my two favorites just because I, I could stomach them. I The main guy in the movie was very confusing because it, it, it felt like uh, sometimes they wanted you to like him. Most of the time they wanted you to think he was a fucking dickhead, but, it, like, they don't make him nuanced enough or interested enough to where you can say, oh, it's part of the character. Like, he's kind of a dick, but at the end of the day, he means well. It's just kind of like, he just kind of switches back and forth. Oh, yeah. He pulls a gun on the person who's letting them stay in his house and not die, and just kind of shoots it off. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of the characters in this, you're kind of like, what is your deal, man? <laughs> right. And I think that's why I like the, those two characters the most, is because the old disgruntled man, his, you know what his deal is. He lives in the woods and he doesn't want to die. Yeah. Uh, the one girl, she wants to hook up with a guy who doesn't show interest, and then she's just insecure in the woods the whole movie. Like, you understand those two. Where everyone else, it's like, I guess, I guess you understand the kid. He wants to get Trumby safe. Um, yeah. Although it's not, not the most interesting... Uh story to follow although I, I i do like some of the weird like goofy things trumpy does i think it's funny that his name is trumpy that's a very funny name for your et ripoff guy <laughs> trumpy i hate how much the kid says trumpy <laughs> what do you think of trumpy's design uh i don't like it that much but it's like also i don't know it's not like it's not like, I don't, I don't know, I look at the aliens and Mac and me and I point at it and say, this is, like, really bad. Like, <laughs> this is exceptionally bad. But then I look at Trumby and it's like, it doesn't look as bad, but it's also significantly less memorable. It's just kind of, I, I don't know, it's just kind of a whatever design. Like, I almost imagine, I could imagine it being, like, a background character in a Star Wars movie, you know? But a background character, you're not going to put any focus on it. What do you think of the yeah. design? Um... I mean, it's kind of cheap looking. It almost looks like a, like a costume you would buy for your kid. Oh, yeah, the costume's terrible. I, I, I just talking like design wise, yeah. Design wise, yeah. No, I, I kind of like them. They, they're interesting looking guys. <clears throat> yeah, the they have these snoots. This film looks like it had like no budget at all. Like they want, what, they're filming. They have a log cabin in the woods to film in, and that's like. Like, you know, that's what I did in high school. We filmed in my house, and then we filmed in the woods, because you you don't need a permit to film in the woods, and you don't need, uh, and there's not other people around in the woods, so that's kind of what high school students do. And I mean, it's not like there's no good movies made in the woods, but it's just like, it's kind of a, I think the woods is playing it as safe as you possibly can when making a movie. It's like one of the most budget-friendly places oh, in yeah. existence. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of E.T. took place in the woods, but a lot of it also took place in the kid's house. Like, that was part of the fun of it. McAmey went a lot harder with its location scouting, you know? Oh, they absolutely. Had a fuck it, they had the fucking McDonald's dance-off. I mean, just just to prove this is not a no-name cast, you've got uh, Frank Brana in there. I think, I, I, I really think he's, uh, like, one of the poachers. But he might be the old man. I am not completely confident in that. Uh, what's I his think name? It's just one of the Frank Brana. Frank Brana. What's he known for? Well, he's in uh, Sergio Leone's Fistful of Dollars trilogy. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've only seen The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Okay. I've only seen The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Uh, great, fucking great movie. He's also in Pieces. Yes. He was in a couple of this director's yeah, movies. 
Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of the the actors who are in this were also in pieces and or slugs. All right. Um. Also, once upon a time in the the West from Sergio Leone's. Nice. I I kind of like. I'm surprised to see like some of these people in like actual stuff because this just did strike me as something similar to. Three Dev Men, where it's just a bunch of people who wanted to make a movie getting together and making a movie. But maybe I should be, like, I don't know. I think maybe we'd get something a little bit more passionate if that were the case. Not, uh, let's try to rip this one thing off. Oh, wait, no, we're ripping the wrong thing off. Let's rip this off instead. But even then, like you said, I don't think it's, like, as blatantly a ripoff as Mac and Me is. Like, because it does feel like it's taken... I would, if it was, like, a good movie, I'd even be able to say, like, it was inspired by E.T. You know, I'd be able to give it that because I don't think it's taken too much away from E.T. Other than the boy in the yeah. alien dynamic. But I don't know. I don't think Spielberg is the first person who came up with that. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, you say, I, I don't actually think the parts of this movie that aren't an E.T. ripoff are necessarily a ripoff of anything specific. Aww. It's just a very generic horror plot. Yeah, that's fair enough. I remember like, you comparing yep, pe- it to... People, people in the woods get killed by aliens. What did I compare it to? I remember you compared it to The Thing, but really, like, saying that out loud, it's not, like, I, The Thing that much at all. I, I I said The Thing because The Thing bombed against E.T., and I think they went, like, oh, that horror movie about an alien did poorly. We're making a uh, horror right. movie about an alien. Let's switch tracks here and make something more like E.T. That makes more because sense, Because E.T. Yeah. is more profitable than The Thing. I don't think it's... I don't think the movie's all that much like The Thing. No. Just... It just is a horror movie with an alien in it. And those were not doing well at the time. <laughs> now, what does start to make it seem a bit more like a ripoff, and I don't think it's actually... Some, it's not something actually presented in the movie, but if you look at that poster... The alien on the poster looks oh, more yeah. like E.T. than the alien in the movie. It looks more like E.T. than no, Trumpy. You, you look at the poster and it's like, gigantic E. Extra, giant T. Terrestrial visitors. Yeah. It's like, they really want you to know, like, E.T. We've got E.T. in this movie. We've got E.T. at home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think the the advertising was more deceptive, more more of an E.T. ripoff than the movie itself actually turned out to be. Right. That is kind of a normal thing, though. Yeah. Like, a lot of people will be like, ooh, like, they'll make the packaging really look like the popular thing, but the actual product is nothing like the actual thing. There's even been movies that have been released more than once under a different, like, box, like, you know, different cover different title that's happened before people it's it's like yeah film is used as a scam <laughs> like it is uh <laughs> it, it, it is used as a way to try to trick people uh we you know i mean one of your most popular videos kind of covers stuff like that right I, mean, I don't know if those are trying to trick people because it looks so blatantly different but there is some stuff where they I... try to come up with a similar box art and like trick an older person into buying it thinking it's well, one that, thing. yeah that's the thing like Dingo Pictures, I think, is very guilty of it, because the art on their boxes tends to be way, way, way better than the art in the cartoons. Yeah. Yeah, the Waboo cover art, you know, it's not, like, the most amazing thing ever made, but oh my god, is it better than what's in that movie. <laughs> I will give this movie credit for a couple of things. Now, The you know, we watched it on, it was uploaded on YouTube, that's where we watched it. It was YouTube, right? Yeah. Um yes. It was in very low resolution. I don't know what the highest resolution would even look like, but very low resolution. The, although I will say, like, despite that, like, looking at some of the shots, uh, some of them were set up pretty nicely. Like, it wasn't a very poorly shot movie. You know, it, it was working with very little, like, minimal stuff, but, like, you know, they had a... They got their good old fog machine out there on those, like, nighttime shots to try to create some cool-looking shots, kind of similar to what the actual E.T. movie did. And, uh, some of the, yeah, some of the shots actually look all right. Like, I don't think it's a terribly shot movie. Um, I think it's, bo- like, kind of boring most of the time. But, I mean, it, it's, it seems like they understood how to operate a camera, at least. I think it's probably better shot than a lot of stuff we've talked about on the show. Yeah. Still, that doesn't mean too much when, you know, you're not that interested in what's going on in those shots. 
there's only so far being well shot will take you, you know? You still have to have, like, a good movie. And even if you don't have a good story or, uh, good characters, you at least better be going, like, super fucking far out with that camera work. Because it's not like the camera work's anything phenomenal, it's just like, yeah, they, they knew what they were, they knew how to make a movie. Yes. I don't know, is there anything else worth covering with this movie? Is there anything else you have? <sighs> not really. Oh, well, uh, I, I, I should give some lip service to the uh, amazing song, Idiot Control. Which I don't think is actually what they're saying, but I can't tell what they are trying to say. And uh, MST3K famously just did a cover of it called Idiot Control. Oh. Because <laughs> um, that's what it sounds like they're saying. And that's that's just such a weird scene. <laughs> Honestly, like them, them recording this song in the the music box and then the the guy does the old like gives him the okay sign and he's like it stinks and uh there's the guy there in the i'm a virgin shirt. yeah I, I was gonna say fuck I, you i i've seen what you've done before we recorded this <laughs> fuck you for that <laughs> if you if you look on the if you look up the actual shirt it says i'm a virgin islander and islanders like really small so the joke is like it looks like it says i'm a virgin but then you get closer and it's like oh i'm a virgin islander except it's so low quality in this movie that he just looks like he's wearing an i'm a virgin shirt did uh does my shirt have islander on it Oh, uh, your hands are in the way. We can't tell. <laughs> Only one way to find out. Find out next time when my hands are lifted up slightly. No, that's not going to happen. Oh, anyway. uh, we'll, we'll we'll reveal it on Patreon. <laughs> if you follow us on Patreon, find out if Michael's shirt says Islander. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, it's just a weird scene. Yeah. <laughs> like all around, and that shirt in particular makes it even weirder. It's just like, good, they're the best. And it's like, thanks, virgin man, who has come out of nowhere. Who doesn't resume being in the movie after this scene. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't come back. <laughs> See, he's the final girl because he's a virgin. Like, I'm sure that wasn't even the filmmakers telling him to wear that. He was just, he knew he had to be in a scene for this movie and he thought it'd be funny to wear that shirt. <laughs> It's like one of the only images on their IMDb page is the I'm a Virgin guy. It's one of the most iconic images from this movie. It is. Like, apart from Trumpy, I think of uh, the I'm a Virgin shirt and the dude doing, like, the OK sign and being like, it stinks. He doesn't <laughs> say it like that. He, he says, it stinks. Oh, so this was a Mystery Science Theater episode. Yes, I said that. I don't remember when you said that. I've said it at least twice now. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that I have that much to say about extraterrestrial visitors. I think we're going to have a lot more to say about Mac and me. Yeah, and despite that, we did go for almost 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there is still something to say yeah. about this movie. It is not devoid of content. Extraterrestrial visitors. It stinks. I, 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 I know you can't see me doing the okay symbol at home, but I guarantee it is. I'm doing it. That doesn't really come through in the podcast format. Uh, before we move on to Mac and Me, I do want to address the one other infamous E.T. ripoff that we could have thrown into this uh, matchup. That is, of course, the classic film Nuki. Uh, although I was under the impression Nuki was really obnoxious, and I'm like, that'd be unfair to put that up against Mac and Me, because I think Mac and Me is pretty funny. I don't want to put an annoying movie up against Mac and Me. But right. uh, I I did need to watch that movie for another project I'm working on, so I went ahead and watched it ahead of this one. I would say it's more boring than it is annoying. It can be a little annoying in places, but mostly it's just boring. I, I would much rather do pod people, a.k.a. extraterrestrial visitors, than Nuki. I think this is a much more fair matchup. Nuki would be totally out of his league against Mac and me. <laughs> yeah. No chance of winning. Because I'll say this much right now, Mac and me is a million times more entertaining than uh, Extraterrestrial Visitor, but a lot of that comes from just how bad it is. Like, <laughs> So there is, a, there is an actual debate here. 
Shall I introduce uh, Mac and me? Please do. So Mac and me, directed by Stuart Raffil, is a movie about a bunch of aliens that get taken from their own world or their own planet down to Earth. Um, they escape the facility that they're stuck in. The mother, father, and daughter escape, but their baby um, escapes as well, but not in the same group. He he goes missing and eventually finds himself in the vehicle of a mother and her two sons, Michael and Eric, who, uh, which I only remember because that's me and my brother's names. Um, otherwise, I would have forgotten them immediately. As they're moving into a new home, there they meet their two neighbors. Uh, I'm only knowing these names because I'm looking at the list. Uh, Courtney and Debbie. And slowly but surely, they start to realize this alien and this, the crazy things he's doing. Like, transforming their entire house. And then the mom thinks her wheelchair-bound son did this within, like, a couple of hours. Um, <laughs> she's completely convinced that he did that and then switched it back. Because she's fucking stupid. Anyway... Um, but yeah, they, they try to, as they get to know this alien better, they realize that he has a family that he's separate from and they try to their very best to keep him away from the government or these men in suits who are really fucking good runners, by the way. And uh, yeah, just reunite it with uh, him with his family. And, uh, yeah, Matt, what did you think of Mac and me? I think Mac and me is the rare product that I am sure is not a parody but if you pretend it's a parody, it's a really funny parody, I think. Yeah. I remember you saying that when we were watching it, and I was like, I think it's okay. Like, it's decently funny, but I don't really know if I'd go that far. And then, like, the last 20 minutes of this movie are fucking wild. <laughs> like, even before the scene in the grocery store, which is a, a, yet another turning point, they do revive three aliens with co with their product placement. <laughs> like, that might be the most blatant product placement I've ever seen in my entire life. They literally, oh, the God, product yeah. that they're promoting throughout the entire movie is what brings three aliens back to life. They use it as an integral part of the story. Oh, God damn. Yeah. This is worse than, like, Fly and Ryan. <laughs> yeah. And Fly and Ryan, like, the entire crux of the story is that he has flying heelys. Because, like, yeah, the Fly and Ryan and this are kind of a commercial, but Fly and Ryan takes a lot of attention away from the heelys. Like, honest to God, you almost, with a movie with the title Fly and Ryan, you almost wish he would use them more often. <laughs> Where this one, Coke is, like, it might be easier to count the number of shots that don't have Coke in it. I'm just, that's an exaggeration, but still. Um... It's in a lot of the movie, though. Like, even in some shots, like, yeah, you don't even see it, like, right away. Sometimes it's just in a shot, like, in the background somewhere. Like, uh, E.T. had, like, the famous Reese's Pieces thing. But that was, like, a single scene he used the Reese's Pieces to, like, lure E.T. back to his house. In this movie, it's just like, oh, these aliens survive off coke. Yeah, pe people get very annoyed by product placement, but to me it's like, in E.T. it's very natural too, you know? It's like, okay, yeah, like real, like a kid would have Reese's Pieces using them to try to lure it, like this thing, and alright, fine, that's, that's whatever. Um, this one, it's shoving coke in your face, like pretty, pretty heavily, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it's being as obnoxious as it wants to be about it. And, and but it is funny. And we forget McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, Ronald McDonald himself shows up. <laughs> yes, Ronald McDonald appears as himself. And they... I, I would say there's less McDonald's in this movie than there is Coke, but, like, the McDonald's stuff is almost, like, even more in your face because it's, like, a whole big dance number set at McDonald's featuring Ronald McDonald. It's like, like, the Coke stuff is just product placement that is far too implemented. This movie stops to have a McDonald's commercial in it. Just a full-on McDonald's commercial. Yeah. Yeah, no, the dancing scene is a McDonald's commercial where it's like... Like, they have so many different people in that, like, restaurant too during that scene, you know? They have, like, fucking football players dancing there for some reason. Like, it does feel like just a grand commercial you have as many like weird costumes in the store as possible 
Um, where in a commercial, you kind of accept that because it's a commercial. It's kind of supposed to be weird. But where in a movie, it's like, why the fuck are all these weird characters here? <laughs> why aren't they just okay with this dancing teddy bear? It's a toy. Now, there's a lot of funny moments in this movie that like that dancing scene's definitely a highlight the scene where we were joking about how he was gonna like me and Stuart watched this with you you and Mitzi and uh we joked about how he was gonna like jump off a cliff um after the scene where oh, he fought well, with I his parents or maybe you said that I I said that because I knew he was about to fall off a cliff okay yeah, me and Stuart were going along with the joke and then he actually falls off a fucking cliff <laughs> So yeah, I guess Matt it's Matt made the joke funny. knowing very well it was coming. That was that was so funny. Then you see the alien swimming after him, and it's just like a like a fucking doll floating in the water. <laughs> but they're trying to claim it's swimming. Every time that thing runs, it reminds me of the fucking video that Psychic Pebbles and uh, or Zach Hadel, as he's more commonly known about now, and Chills made, where it's like if I ever saw that thing running in my living room, I would like it. Just shows like a little goblin key- creature run. That is what it reminded me of every time you saw that thing run around. Very, very funny. Very funny designs for these characters. Not intentional. I will say, though, the alien designs, they're not good, but I did notice effort in a couple of areas. Effort that um, extraterrestrial visitors did not have. or it's, I, sh- I should just yes. call it pod people. That's easier. Because there's a scene where he gets hit by a car where they have a different puppet for that. There's a scene where he's grabbing onto something as he's trying not to go get blown away. They have a different pu- puppet for that. And I think both of those puppets actually looked pretty good. For the scene that they were supposed to be in, like, yeah, that that's a good way to exaggerate the features of this character. When it's just their standard puppet, though, it, like, they tried. It, it can move its ears, it can move its eyes, its eyelids, it, like, you know, they have it, like, like tearing up. Like, they, they were clearly trying pretty hard with this thing, but they just didn't quite get it. He looks really uncanny the entire time, and it never works, and a big part of that... I remember we talked about this, like E.T., the puppetry in that movie is done exceptionally well. They have an actual person in the costume, to be fair for the bigger guys, they have a person in the costume too. Um, but like for E.T., they were able to kind of get the movement sound and because of the alien like body, the wrinkled body doesn't like, it's not as weird where in this movie it does just kind of look like a bunch of naked, like naked people with like yeah. fucked up bodies. yeah. They, they they look a little too naked. They give them clothes at the end of the movies, and the designs are legitimately improved by it. Like, there's a scene <laughs> yes. where the little alien's wearing a t-shirt that's too big for him, and that's the cutest he looks in the entire movie. Because it's like, ah, oh, he, he has a little shirt on that's too big for him. Um, but, like, we're in the rest of the movie, it's, like, very hard to find this thing cute, even though they clearly want you to find it cute. Yeah. But I will give them prop, props for the effort, because it does actually feel like these puppets, like, they put a decent amount of effort into it. Yeah, these aren't... These, these are not awful puppets. Um, there's stuff about them that doesn't work. They are a little weird. They are a little uncanny. But, uh, uh you can't say they cheaped out on these. Where pod people, the, the costumes look a little cheap. Granted, you know, these guys, they had that Coke and McDonald's money they could spend on the, the aliens... You know? Oh, yeah. The one thing that does kind of bother me is that they don't move their mouths. Their mouths stay static the whole time, and that bothers me. Yeah. That's true. That makes it kind of harder for them to emote. They communicate with noises, but... That's another thing. They communicate with noises. Like, E.T. is very charming because, you know, like, he's... At first, he doesn't know how to communicate with them, but he kind of slowly starts to pick up on words. Like, he can say words, he just doesn't know what they're saying initially. So that's why he's, like, kind of trying to get used to certain words. Like, he's kind of figuring out their language as the movie goes on. Where in this one, they never really evolve that way at all. Um, They just kind of keep making noises. And I think that, like, I don't know, I think E.T., like slowly not like he's not speaking like fluid english by the end of the movie they don't it doesn't need to be like that but just him like kind of picking up on these their ways of communicating like it definitely like you know it 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 helps the character a lot it helps the character grow a lot i this is like something um a little off topic from where we're saying i do want to say something like that i think is crazy about this movie though because you have, like, some people in this that, you know, you don't really you don't really have, like, a lot of cast members that are, like, super well-known, I don't feel. But there is, like, 
one, and maybe you'll be able to tell me that there's another one, but one really major name on this movie. I mean, huge. And that is Alan Sil- Silvestri. I can't pronounce his last name. Who is the fucking composer for this movie, who is also known for Avengers Endgame, Back to the Future 1 and 2, Polar Express, <laughs> Predator, Christmas Carol, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Castaway, Captain America, the winner uh the first Avenger, like the Mummy, like the Night the Museum movies, the Mummy Returns, like just these huge, huge fucking movies. Like one of the most popular He's worked. He's worked with Spielberg. Yeah. One of the most popular, like, uh, he's, he, he, Adventures Endgame might be the most successful movie ever made. I don't know if like, but uh, based on inflation, I think that's still gone with the wind, but, but still one of the biggest movies ever he is the composer for and he did Mac and me. So let that story humble you a little bit. If you're trying to do anything artistic, to be fair, I don't remember the music in Mac and me being bad. I just don't remember it that well. Oh, he also did a Pinocchio from 2022. Do you want to guess which one he did? Mm, the Disney one. Yes, unfortunately. He didn't get to do the really funny one, that, and he didn't get to do the good one. I only said that because he works with Zemeckis, and Zemeckis made the, the Disney one. Hell, he works with Disney a lot because of the Marvel movies. The music in this, I think, is very John Williams-y. <laughs> like, they do try to make it sound like E.T., but I think it's almost... I don't know, it's almost a little too much, it's a little too whimsical, it's a little too childish. It doesn't it doesn't quite hit where John Williams does so often. Right. For me it was just not remem- like memorable. Like I can't really I I love like I love film scores and I'm normally able to like comment on that in these like, oh I like the music at least or Oh, I hated the mu I I, I really liked the five seconds of Indiana Jones they use. Like I'm able to give some sort of comment, you know? The, <laughs> bringing those movies up a lot today. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I I just don't remember the music in this movie though. Um, I, I like some of his other scores, like you know, Back to the Future's Back to the Future. Uh, Marvel movies don't even have the best music in my opinion, but Endgame and Infinity War absolutely did have good music in them. And then uh, you know, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Uh, Polar Express has a really good score, even though I don't, I don't I don't love that movie, but the music's really good. Forrest Gump, I didn't even mention that one. That's a ba- iconic set score. Um, so this is definitely a talented composer, but Mac and me like completely in one year out, out uh, completely in one year out the other. I do not remember it at all, and we just watched this yesterday. Yeah, I think we should dedicate the ending of our discussion on this movie to the ending of the movie. So before we get to that, do you want to talk about casting or anything else? Uh. Yeah, I mean, the, there's a lot I have to talk about with the ending. Because you have both, like, the climax of the movie and uh, the, the final scene. I yeah. think we should talk about both. But yeah. uh, let's let's ju- dive into cast before we get there. Talk about each character individually. Because uh, this movie does actually... The, the kid's in a wheelchair. The actor actually was wheelchair-bound. So this movie has gotten, like, some praise for, like, being one of the first movies to have a wheelchair bound kid played by an actual wheelchair bound kid i was gonna say there's scenes where he's getting in out of his bed where i was like if he's acting he's like doing a really in, like good work with his legs because he did not look like when he was getting into his chair he looked like he actually like was wheelchair bounded so i i thought that was probably the case um otherwise he, he would have that would have been very impressive but yeah that's neat uh the performance itself it's kind of like flying ryan-esque like he's just the main he's just the main boy. He's not like he wasn't annoying or anything. He's just nothing nothing much to say about him. It's like a corny performance, but he's a kid, give him a pass. Yeah, I don't think he's like a horrible child actor or anything, but he also fails to leave much of an impression. The older brother in this is named Michael. You mentioned that already. The older brother was also named Michael in E.T. They just stole <laughs> the older brother's name from E.T. They're they're similar characters, too. That's how close they fly to E.T. with this movie. Like, they come really close to being E.T. in a lot of places. They steal the bicycle scene. Stort mentioned that. Yeah, like, they do it with a wheelchair instead of a bike, but... I, I, I actually like the one in Mackamy more than the one in E.T. 
because I thought it was really, really fucking funny. But, um... I, I have heard people speculate that they only put the kid in a wheelchair so they could do a take on the bike scene. I would not doubt that. They didn't want to do a bike, so they're like, uh, he has a wheelchair. Yeah. That doesn't, that would not surprise me at all. Because, I mean, they, there's, like, shot, the scenery looks the same as E.T., and there are shots that are almost identical to what they have in E.T. Oh, yeah, no, this, I mean, it takes place in L.A., I think, just like E.T. does. And they're at least both set in California, so, similar area. That's oh, where we got, when we, when we start talking about the end of the movie, that's the scene we have to start with, because that is, like... The movie only gets funnier and funny from there, but to me that is like truly the scene where like the movie, there were scenes before that that were funny, but that was like, from there on, the movie is like hilarious. It's like, it's a masterpiece of like, so bad it's good cinema. <laughs> Michael in this movie is very similar to the other character though. I no, no, don't have much to say about him. He's the older brother. He, yeah, Michael in E.T. has a better performance, you know. He, he He's like a lamer version of Michael from E.T., Christine Eversold is in this, and she has actually been in, like, some stuff. She was in Wolf of Wall Street, she was in Licorice Pizza, she was in Amadeus, like... She is, like, a unknown actress. She has oh. worked with some names. Granted, it seems like she got more popular after this film. Like, most, most of her best-known stuff. Although, yeah, Amadeus would have been before this, and Tootsie also was before this, so... Not she entirely. Was a- she was in Steven Universe. Who did she voice in Steven Universe? She was White Diamond in Steven Universe. Oh. Yeah, she was very mom in this movie. <laughs> she she filled the role of a mother quite well, I think. One of the better performances. Yeah, I'd say she probably did the best job out of anyone in this, but a- as a result, she's almost less memorable for it, you know? I mean, that's fair. That's a she's... fair point to make. She's like a talented actor, though. She she clearly can act. It's just, uh, she's, you know, like, not that the others aren't necessarily trying, but she's like, uh, she's just kind of delivering the, the character of, like, a concerned mother fine, but the only parts where I don't buy the character is when she, like, believes her son, again, completely altered their house within a couple of hours when he can't even walk, so, but that's not her fault, that's the script's fault. <laughs> This is, there is Debbie, the girl next door. Uh, what'd you think of her? Um, another kind of like flying Ryan esque kid's performance, to be honest. Like, is oh here's the here's the thing. They're able her and the boy in the wheelchair, along with flying Ryan, um, are able to emote. You know, that's the thing. Like, it's not a very convincing performance, but you've I've seen kid performances where they speak in the same tone the entire movie. They are able to sound mad. They are able to sound happy or like overly yeah. excited like that they're that that's like they, they're trying you know they're like it's not a very good performance but for a movie like this it's perfectly serviceable yeah they're they're overdoing it but uh they are at least trying yeah because yeah i i have seen child performers where it's just talking like this the entire time because you know and again not gonna blame a kid for that that's Anytime you see a bad child performance, it's the director's fault. It's never the kid's fault. Because <laughs> you don't you don't hire a kid if they can't do it. She has a sister. Yes. Tina Kasperi as Courtney, Ooh. who's the very, very 80s girl. Yeah. Although uh, her, her defining personality trait is actually that she works at McDonald's. I think they should have had her join their little group a little earlier, because it kind of like feels like by the end of the movie, she's like a part of the gang trying to save the alien, but it almost feels like they throw her in a little too late. Like, it's like, okay, we had to, we didn't actually get a chance to know her. We got to know Eric, Michael, and Debbie perfectly well, but Courtney, not really. She's McDonald's yeah. employee. <laughs> they should have just called her, that's, that's what her name should have been, McDonald's employee. McDonald's employee. Number My sister one. McDonald's employee number two. Don't even make her number one. Make her number two. You don't know who number one is. <laughs> as far as noteworthy cast members, there is a very big name appearing in this film. Years before she was famous for anything, Miss Jennifer Aniston appears as a dancing kid in the movie. Oh yeah, you mentioned that when we were watching it. Didn't but recognize which of... one was her, but she was probably very young. I mean. I was gonna compare it to, like, Drew Carey. It's... Drew Carey. 
<laughs> I was gonna compare it to Drew Barrymore in E.T., but uh I like Drew Barrymore is the main character of that movie. Jennifer Aniston is just in this movie somewhere. Yeah, you're getting like tons of close up shots on like the girl's face, so it's like, oh okay, I, you can start to like recognize her. Where Jennifer Aniston, yeah, I did not. I was trying to find her when you told me she was in it, but I was like, I, I don't recognize. I, I don't. I don't see it. Yeah, I didn't see her either. Has she been in a movie yet? Because this counts. Her appearance in Mac and Me counts. Nah, she hasn't been in anything yet. I don't think. I don't believe so. No. I don't think anyone from any either of these two movies who have appeared in a Hall of Victories yet. Nope. All newcomers, as far as I can tell. I guess that's all I have, really, in terms of, like, cast members, specific cast members to talk about. Like, there's, like, characters, like, that are in uh, ensembles of people that I find funny. But, like, like the guy, again, the guy's in the suits. And that'll bring us into talking about the final scenes if you have nothing else to say about Do you have anything else to say about the cast? Any other cast members worth mentioning? Oh, uh, well, I do want to mention the director, Stuart Raphil. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go with Raphil. Because he directed Tammy and the T-Rex. Which is a great movie. Is it? He he had a friend who was like, Hey man, I can get access to a, an animatronic T-Rex for like a week. Can you write a movie about it? <laughs> and so he just like real quickly threw together this script about like a, a boy's brain getting implanted in a T-Rex. I think it's even in in the story. I think it's uh an animatronic T-Rex, not even a real T-Rex. I mean, hey, that's that's pretty clever. And the 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 boy whose brain gets put in the T-Rex is played by Paul Walker. Yeah, and uh, he also has Denise Richards in there. So you got some pretty like big names. Yes. Yeah, Buck Flower in that, so if we ever do cover Tammy and the T-Rex, for which from the sounds of it, I don't know if we will from the sounds of it, uh, but we, Buck Flower was also in Macamie, and then Efren Ramirez from uh, The Crank, although that was for Out of the Ring, so that wouldn't count. But yeah, we would have some, if we ever cover Tammy and the T-Rex, we'd have some returning faces. That movie's so fun. Although, I should say, I'm watching the gore cut. It was... It was originally, like, a gory R-rated movie, and then he cut it back to be, like, a PG-13 movie. But they have restored the gore cut, and the gore cut is really funny. Alright, we'll have to, have to check out the gore cut sometime. I guess one more thing before we talk about the ending. 7% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, I guess so. Does that seem a little... Considering some of the other things we've seen in the past, does that seem a little harsh to you? Yes, I would say so. Granted, based on that how is the tomatoes... percentage. Yeah, that is the percentage of like critics who didn't like it. I'm sure most critics are looking at this and being like, "Oh, it's bad, but it's kind of funny." Because, like, yeah, I I would probably rank it as like a four out of ten, just because even though it's. Yeah, it's a very bad movie. It's very funny, and it has a lot of personality, and there is a genuine effort being made in parts of it. So I I, I respect it more than a lot of movies. So I, I, I would go four, but yeah, I'm Rotten Tomatoes. I would be contributing to that 7% then because, yeah, like a five, everybody ranks, rates it a five, it's a zero. Everybody rates, uh, rates it a six, it's a 100. It's a stupid fucking system they have, but... Yeah, a little... IMDb has a uh, 3.3, and that's a lot more reasonable. I mean, there are a lot of, like, 10 out of 10 ratings for it, or, or 5 out of 5, I should say, on uh, Letterboxd. Uh, I, I could imagine giving it a ironic 10 out of 10 after watching the last 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes of this movie. Because, okay, like, you w actually, you mentioned, even earlier in the scene, we mentioned the wheelchair scene is really funny. Didn't you say something about Paul, Paul Rudd and Conan during that? Yeah, no, it's it's become a running gag between uh, Paul Rudd and Conan O'Brien that every time Paul Rudd is on his show, he shows that clip from Mac and Me. <laughs> Just like, okay, we've got a and clip. He, he, they play. Yeah, he always sets it up like it's something else. Like the first time he's like, oh, here's an exclusive clip from the final episode of Friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then it was... It was the kid falling off the cliff and macking me. <laughs> and then, uh, 
That's funny. I I kind of want to check those out now. Like if I had a fucking talk show and I had like if I if if life ever took us in a weird place like that where one of us had a fucking talk show and we had like the other on like that'd absolutely be some shit I'd pull. Where I'm just like, all right, every single time Matt comes on, I'm playing the dancing scene from Marmaduke. <laughs> um, I uh, the chase scene was the first scene of this movie where I was like, all right, I think this is really funny, and it's mainly just because in the chase scene in ET that they are directly ripping off in the scene. They have, um, like people poli- like they're running, they're like being chased by police cars. You know, they're being chased by people who are doing like stopping it nothing to stop them in transportation vehicles where these guys are just fucking running at them. They're running on foot, but they're keeping up. <laughs> they're keeping up the entire time. And it's hilarious. Cause again, they don't have wheels. They don't have any form of transportation. There's a part where they're like in a car, right? They're in a van and they're keeping up. Like, they're doing a yeah. really good job of tracking these kids down. And there's also some, like, decent slapstick in that. I like the parts in the store where they all just, like, kind of fucking slide into something. I don't know. Just the image of all these guys dressed the same way and making these, like, really aggressive faces. Just that scene cracked me the hell up. I had a lot of fun watching that. <laughs> Again, yeah. it, felt like it, it felt like a parody in that scene. Right. Yeah. No, that's the type of stuff I'm talking about. That the fact that, like, it takes people forever to, to like, notice that the alien is clearly in the house feels like a joke. Right. The excessive product placement feels like a joke. Yeah. Even, it... uh, you know, Max, like, rubbery proportions, you know? He gets hit by a car and he, like, stretches out. He's got a very stretchy body. That almost feels like a joke. Like, they're trying to be, like, a cartoon. Yeah. The fucking revival, I know we already talked about this, but them reviving the dead characters of Coke feels like something that a parody movie would do for sure. Like, it feels yeah, like that... such a, it feels so fucking shameless that the only way you could do it is a joke. But they did it completely unironically. <laughs> yeah. In the wheelchair accessible cave. And to be fair... That does make it funnier. The fact that it is... Sens- yeah, the wheelchair accessible cave. I forgot about that. They have a fucking ramp set up for the kid. <laughs> like, this entire world is very thoughtful of the handicapped. No, but, like, it is funnier that it's not self-aware, though. Because if it was self-aware, like, it would still be funny. But the, fa- the fact that it isn't self-aware, I do think, makes it funnier. funnier <laughs> that, like... They no, they really did just want to do this for the product. Like I, either Coke was demanding this, or they were just going all out with it, like completely shame. Like they did, they had zero I, shame I, doing it. I feel like they wrote this so that they could get the Coke money. It's like, hey, Coke, here's this cool story about how great your product is. It brings these aliens back to life. Yeah, or maybe there was like they were Coke. They were on, like, really good terms of Coke making the movie, but then they saw, like, the make the scene where the alien rejects the Coke. So then they took the film's director, tied him up in the desert, had him, like, st- sitting over a grave, and then they said, the only way you're getting out of this is if you end it like this. Ah, so that's what they were using those Coca-Cola death squads I've been hearing about for. Yeah. <laughs> Guess, yeah, there is a scene where the alien rejects the Coke. He doesn't want the Coke. So I, I, I personally will never buy another Coke product again because that scene, like, enhanced my brain to not want to drink Coke because the alien didn't want to drink Coke. It's quite funny to me. They end up in, like, a real supermarket, and there's a fridge in the background that's for Pepsi, but you cannot see the word Pepsi on it. <laughs> so the following scene is the scene where they go into the store. Yes. Which... That's, the, uh, they bring the aliens back to life, drive them back to civilization, and they're like, we're gonna go into this, this store and get a bunch of Coca-Cola. Because we love Coke so much. They steal a girl's Sprite. Yeah. That girl is stoned out of her gourd. Like, she's looking over at this other car and she's like, oh man, there's some fucking alien dudes in that car. And she's just kind of, like, awkward about it. She's just kind of sheepishly, like, waving at them. And then they steal her sprite, and she's like, oh, fuck, the alien guys are real. 
Yeah. Uh, that was a very rational reaction. Like, she sees that and it's like, all right, maybe they're costumes or this. Like, I, she doesn't, like, give much of a reaction. Doesn't doesn't know how to react. But then their arms stretch into her, like, th- through the glass and into her car and uh, take a sprite from her. And, yeah, that, that, that does instigate a little bit of panic. <laughs> Um, but then they go into the store and everybody starts freaking out and then the police pull guns on them and then the alien takes the gun from the cops and it just fucking escalates so much. They, so they quickly. blow up a gas station. They blow up a gas station and kill uh, the main kid, Eric. Yeah. Except uh, it's it's like super fake looking. And years later, people found out that originally Eric got shot by a police officer in that scene. Yeah. And they changed it. <laughs> and the the Japanese version has him getting shot by the police in it still. Yeah, you can see that clip of the kid getting shot. It's so fucking weird. Like, here's the thing. I, 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 I get that it's weird to have a movie where a kid, like, a movie like your E.T. Um, knockoff have a scene where a child gets shot by a police officer. I get that. But it's even weirder in the other scene because, like, in the movie, <laughs> the alien starts shooting at the cops because they shot the kid. Where in... Uh, which, again, it's kind of crazy to describe the scene now after describing the rest of the movie because it's pretty fucking different from the rest of the movie. <laughs> but, also, but, but, but in this remake, because of that, it just looks like the alien randomly turns around and decides to start shooting at the police for no reason. He just fucking does it. Uh, yeah. It, like, <laughs> so it's it just, also it's also very unclear what actually kills him. Yeah, like he, it, it's just near an explosion, and that hurts him. Yeah, like he's not really any like closer to it than the police are. So it's kind of weird. You see a silhouette shot of him lying there. So yeah, it doesn't work. It's very bizarre. But uh, yeah. Um, well, they uh, they they Pokemon the movie him back to life. Yeah, without Coke, I thought that'd been so fucking funny if they used a Coke to revive him <laughs> after getting shot. Just pour a little bit into the bullet wound. It's reminiscent of how like E.T. is dying and and uh, Elliot is also dying because of E.T. and E.T. kind of like. Like, E.T. E. has healing powers, but they're like, nah, fuck that. Our aliens can bring people back from the dead. And then they're accepted for that, which, I mean, fair enough. They did try to steal Coca-Cola, the most sacred item on Earth, <laughs> and then uh, shoot at the police. But but now that they've uh, proven that they can bring people back from the dead, it's like, all right, well, I mean, we can use that. I saw Mac in a Walmart in L.A. He was trying to steal some Twix bars. <laughs> and then, of course, he, you get to, like, the very ridiculous final scene of the movie. Where the alien family gets sworn in as U.S. citizens. Which is, like... We kind of watched these in the order of, like... like Extraterrestrial Visitors has the saddest ending, I think. Yeah. where Where, like... All of the adult aliens are dead, and then Trumpy's friend is just like, Trumpy, fuck off. Go home. We don't want you here anymore. Yeah. And then then you've got E.T., which has this, like, bittersweet ending where, where E.T. has to go home, but Elliot's like, oh, I'm gonna miss you, E.T. And yeah. then you have this one that's just like, yep, they're U.S. citizens. They live on Earth now. <laughs> I love, I love, because, like, an E.T., like, it's a, a very cynical way to look at that. the ending of that movie is like, hey... There's probably going to be consequences after this scene <laughs> that we don't see. Because, <laughs> you know, what these kids did. There's Something's probably going to happen to them once they leave. That's, again, the cynical way to look at it. The Spielberg way to look at it, I am sure, is that they all live happily ever after. But uh, in this one, it's just like, yep, nope, here they are. They're, like It just shows the aftermath and they're all good. <laughs> What's funny is this movie came out the same year as Short Circuit 2. And Short Circuit 2 has that same ending. With uh, Johnny Five getting sworn in as a U.S. citizen. <laughs> I think that movie earns it a little better. I don't think either movie was ripping the other one off. I think that's pure coincidence. I think it's a hilarious... And I understand it's because they bring people back to life, but I think it is hilarious that the scene following the police shootout is them being sworn in. 
<laughs> wearing those goofy outfits with a f- expression that doesn't look any different than they had the entire movie. <laughs> That's probably one of the most famous shots in the entire film. Whenever you look yes. it up, you see that shot of the alien in the suit. <laughs> not even the main alien, not even our main character, just one of the other aliens in a suit. <laughs> The Mysterious Alien Creature. That's what MAC stands for. <laughs> Although, of course, everyone has to joke that it's actually for Big Mac because of the McDonald's par- product placement. I didn't joke about that. That's what I actually <laughs> thought, though. That wasn't a joke. That was real. You're not even the only one who has said that. M- Mitzi did make that uh, comment at, like, the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> Yes, but I, that's like a, a common joke people make about the film is that Mac is like somehow related to McDonald's or, or a big Mac. So, yeah, um, this isn't to say that like quality wise it's this high up, but on my Hollow Victories list, uh, this one's number four. Um, because I, don't think I, I have it that high, but I do I, have it decently high. I, I enjoyed it oh, that I have it much. At five. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I thought about it. Initially, I had it at, like, six. Uh, but I was like, I do think that this is funnier than Serenity and Tank Girl, so I'm putting it up. So my top five right now is Tank Girl, Mac and Me, Cat in the Hat, Grinch, and Book of Henry. Book of Henry is still the funniest fucking thing we watched on the show, but this one's getting there. I, I still have Serenity above Mac and Me. But it is, it's Book of Henry, Serenity, Catwoman, and Batman and Robin, so, like... All four of my top slots are from two different episodes. But it, it's a... Uh, this one was really fucking funny. And it it takes a little while to hit that peak. But once it gets there, it just gets more and more ridiculous scene by scene. Because <laughs> hell, I had mentioned that the chase scene is where it starts. Actually, right before that is the McDonald's scene. And the McDonald's scene was funny. Like, it, yeah. it, 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 it's, it just keeps escalating. It, it goes from being like a... E.T. knockoff where there's like occasional things to make jokes about like the cliff scene or how like goofy it looks when they vacuum up the alien or the mom thinking that her son altered the house like just all this like they're like these little laughs um but then from there on it's just like a fucking comedic like gold mine like it, it it's so fucking funny I was laughing a lot watching this I'm I will show this one to some people just because I I want them to I, I just want to experience that with someone again like but not when the movie just like completely fucking loses its mind because <laughs> it's yeah. such a it's such a standard knockoff for like a while and then it just goes fucking ape shit I mean are we at the end are we gonna vote now yeah <laughs> Because I, I gotta be truthful, like, I I, I think this is a fun pair-up, but I, I did this matchup so we could watch Mac and Me. Like, pod people is just like, oh yeah, that's like another kind of funny E.T. ripoff. I just wanted to show you Mac and Me. This is a really funny movie. My vote is for Mac and Me. Yeah. Just, it- just purely on entertainment value. I do think it is probably the better made movie as well, but... I agree. Eh, I th- there's debate there, but it's definitely the more entertaining I of think, the two. I think that Extraterrestrial Visitors probably has, like, if you look at the nicest shot from each movie, Extraterrestrial Visitors... No, you know what? No. Because the shot of, like, even as stupid as the fucking shot is, the shot of, like, the wheelchair kid behind the explosion, like, there's, like, that silhouette. That probably, like, that was a nice-looking shot. It's a stupid fucking scene. But... It was well shot, you know, so I can't really, I can't really say that, like, I don't even know if I can really say that, like, Extraterrestrial Visitors has the better cinematography. I think its cinematography is, like, pretty decent all throughout. There's a lot less, like, cursed images in that movie, but Mac and Me is just so much more fun to look at, you know, and it is, like, try again, like, it's not, like, a completely effortless movie either, like, there is, like, some effort, there's more effort in the puppetry in this movie than fucking... Um, extraterrestrial, or pod people, or whatever it is. Um, better characters, even if even if they're not like, even if they're goofy characters and over the top, you know, better than what fucking pod people had. Um, more memorable alien design at the very least. Uh, and yeah, just entertainment value. I think that extra uh, extraterrestrial visitors is like one of the most boring films we've watched in the history of the show. I. 
I think you think this movie is a lot more boring than I do, because there is, a, like, plenty about the movie I enjoy. I admit, it has some, like, pretty boring parts to it. Uh, I did not love Extraterrestrial Visitors, where I, I do kind of love Mac and me. <laughs> yeah. I don't have Extraterrestrial Visitors even, like, ranked that low. Like, it's definitely towards the bottom of the list, but, like, it's number 33 out of 46. You know, it's 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 above more than 10 of the movies, but... But yeah, like I, I was not like I paid attention to it very well. Like it wasn't too long either. It was a pretty short movie. But I, I wasn't having a great time watching that. This one was like some of the most fun I had watching any of these. Yeah, the audience is with us on this one. Sixty nine percent from Mac and me. <laughs> nice. But doesn't uh, d- does not break the seventy uh, percent mark. So it's uh, not quite a, a passing grade there. That's a C still. A 69 is a C? Oh. C plus. Or, well, D plus. There we yeah, go. D, D plus. plus. And D, uh, D would still be passing. Just barely passing. Depends on where you are. That's true. Anyways, Mac and me win. Uh, Alright, so next time, we've got two... I mean, th- this is gonna be, like, one of the more obscure matchups, but uh, there is, like... Plenty of uh, uh, critical distaste for these two movies out there. I think most of it was confined to their times. I think these two films have maybe been forgotten a little since. But you can still find them out there. People do still talk about them sometimes. It's two films from the early 80s that dared to ask the question, What if Tarzan, but there was a pretty lady? I'm, of course, uh, talking about Bo Derek in Tarzan the ape man versus tanya roberts in sheena queen of the jungle to uh two sexy tales of tarzan like characters never heard of either of both will be interesting both very disliked both both pretty widely disliked um they're interesting uh i think i have an idea which one is gonna win but uh they are both interesting movies all right looking forward to it um you have anything else to say before we end this one off? Uh, no, I think I'm good. All right, then for my co-host, Michael Shadakel, I am Matt Presents. I will see you in the next one. Peace.